Okay, let's get started. Morning, afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be sharing a couple of slides to start off with, and then just for you guys to know, uh, this session is also recorded, and I'll be sharing this on the um, on the Trailblazer community group once uh, once the meeting is finished. So I'm just going to share my screen. All right. So quick, uh, quick round of intros. Uh, my name is Ali Said. I am the Marketing Cloud User Group uh, Leader in Dubai. Um, been using Marketing Cloud for uh, 10 years now. Um, bit of background by myself. I used to work for Salesforce um, back in London, moved over to Dubai two and a half years ago and now working for a, um, for a Salesforce partner. And um, I signed up to be a Marketing Cloud User Group just over a year ago. and. Uh, um, luckily, I've had some amazing presenters to contribute and participate in these sessions. And today we have a, a super special guest, uh, Martin Kine. So I'll hand over the mic over to you, Martin, for you to introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Ali. And thank you, uh, user group. Uh, I'm coming to you from New York. It's freezing cold and it's early. So uh, <laughs> nice to see you all. And uh, Greetings from across the ocean. Uh, so I'm Marty Kine. I'm SVP of Market Strategy for Salesforce Marketing Cloud, which is the suite of MarTech and AdTech applications we offer, obviously. And uh, I joined Salesforce in 2018 in the fall, specifically to focus on Salesforce CDP, Customer Data Platform, which is a newish product that's been out about um, 14, 15 months now in general availability. And before that, I was a Gartner. I was an analyst covering marketing clouds, an industry analyst covering um, Salesforce and its competitors. And before that, I had some years in the advertising business doing measurement. So I was an analytics guy. So thanks, Ali, for inviting me. And I'll uh, hand it back to you for a sec, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Martin. So um, so guys, today's focus is purely CDP. Um, as you guys know, Martin, as a CDP expert, he's also written a, a book specifically on, on CDP. And um, I was quite happy that he agreed to participate in today's session and he'll be talking you through everything you need to know about CDP from the foundation of CDP and then obviously what Salesforce CDP is about. So um, I'm gonna hand over back to you actually, Martin. So if you don't mind, if you can share your screen, please. Yeah, that sounds good. And the book you mentioned was is this one here, Customer Data Platforms, you can see. <laughs> and uh, I co-wrote it with Chris O'Hara, my good friend, uh, also based in New York. And so what I want to do today is to take you behind the scenes a little bit on how Salesforce approached the market, uh, what I saw both as a Gartner analyst and at Salesforce around the customer data platform, what that category is, what they do, and how Salesforce's approach is different than other companies um, a little bit. It's not a... Uh, it's not a sales pitch, obviously, but it's sort of like a description of this fascinating tech category. And I have, uh, I also have a, a demo if I, if it works on the video. So we'll see if I can get that working toward the end of what our product looks and feels like. You get a sense of it. Um, so I will share my screen now. And because of the way Microsoft Teams works, at least the way I work it, it uh, my video will disappear. <laughs> So you will not uh, see me, but do not despair. I'm still here. All right, let me uh, just share a few visual aids. And uh, we're a cozy group, you know, if you want to interrupt me or you disagree with something, that's perfectly fine. We can have a discussion. Uh, so uh, Salesforce itself, you all are Salesforce experts, I know, but Salesforce itself is, in, is an interesting company. <laughs> it's um, 20 years ago, it was founded on Sales Cloud, which is kind of B2B, and they pioneered or was one of the early players in the SaaS software subscription market. So partly the business model was um, what made it successful and partly the, the, the um, business that it decided to enter. And then Service Cloud was built, it appeared later, but it was built, there were some acquisitions, but it was built primarily by Salesforce engineers on top of the same um, uh, intellectual property that they developed around Sales Cloud. So Service Cloud and Sales Cloud are very much of a piece. And then as we transformed later on, on over, over to the Lightning front end, you saw the transformation happen in Sales and Service Cloud. And, uh, you know, so 
those two products that on the B2B side, which is you know, most the majority of Salesforce revenue, they kind of look and feel the same and they function similarly. And if you're an admin in the sales cloud, you can become an admin in the service cloud without too much, too much extra training. And things like the Lightning components and all of that functions the same way. Marketing cloud has been a little bit different. Marketing quite a bit different, actually. Marketing cloud is, is newer. It's not as new as Commerce Cloud, which was the demand or acquisition. But Marketing Cloud has been formed over the years through a series of acquisitions. Um, starting, I mean, way back in actually the social days, they acquired them, Radiant 6 and Buddy Media. You may not remember Buddy Media. Buddy Media was really hot back when brands had F Facebook tabs and they were building brand pages. But Facebook you know, changed its product, so Buddy Media's proposition became less compelling. But it was it seemed really hot for a minute. And then Radiant 6 is an analytics platform. We still kind of, um, we still, it's still used. And then Exact Target was kind of the, the backbone of Salesforce Marketing Cloud. Exact Target is, is uh, obviously messaging, messaging and journeys. And a big company, very successful acquisition, has grown tremendously over the years. Um, and then Salesforce added a couple other acquisitions. Crux is a um, data management platform, and most recently, Datarama. But the CDP, when we were approaching CDP, customer data platform, it was, it was done differently. That's why I'm showing you this picture here. Salesforce Customer 360 is the umbrella term for everything. And uh, I'm associated with the product team. So the product strategy for Salesforce is to support business transformation, help our customers connect to their customers. And customer data platform, even though it, it's the demand comes from primarily from marketing and it's you know CMOs, CMTOs who are asking for this, this tool, this product, not only, but but especially in the beginning, primarily for marketing, uh, it does deal with customer data and it's an attempt to unify customer data and it's right in the middle. You can see that circle there. Our customers connect to their customers on the, on the B2C and the, and the B2B context, it might be an account, but it's still very central to the whole platform idea. So that's my way of, of teeing up the fact that Salesforce CDP was built by Salesforce engineers. It was not an acquisition. So it kind of, it was unusual in the marketing cloud context. And I was there when um, they were they were deciding, this was 2018, the category appears, and I'll give you a little background in a second, but um, when they did the build by, um, the build by partner analysis, which every big software company would do, you're trying to figure out this new thing. So do we acquire a company? Uh, and incorporate it, do we partner, maybe do a white label. We had done that previously with Interaction Studio, although that's no longer the case. And uh, it seemed too central and too important to partner. So we want to own it. And all the acquisition candidates were somehow partial. They, they didn't have the, the full range of capabilities we needed. Also, acquisition itself presents its own challenges for integration. So we decided to build it. And so that's why Salesforce CDP is the first thing within the Salesforce um, tool set and the first thing within the, the marketing cloud context that is a significant new product that's built by Salesforce on Salesforce. And that has a lot of, that was an early design decision that has a lot of implications. And it was not the obvious way to go, um, but it, 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 uh, it's gonna give us a lot of goodness in the long run. Um, this thing here is single source of truth. I mean, you all, you all know what CDPs are supposed to do. They basically organize customer data. That's as simple as that. So you say, well, why, you know, why is this new? Um, and you know, haven't marketers always been organizing their customer data? And the answer is yes. It, it, it is true. Marketers have always been organizing their customer data. The idea of organizing customer data is not new. Uh, and in fact, there's been a lot of confusion in this category. It was invented in 2013, CDP as a category, by a guy named David Robb. He, he claims this, and we've checked it out, me and Chris, when we wrote our book, and it, it appears to be true. He wrote a blog post where he, he gave a name to this category called Customer Data Platform, CDP. And he picked it as an acronym because it had three letters and it wasn't uh, currently being used for anything else of note. So. So he, he did it quite consciously. David Robb is now the head of the Customer Data Platform Institute.
based in it was based in Philadelphia and he recently moved it's basically just him and his wife moved to uh, Connecticut but uh, lovely man but he he named it in 2013 nobody talked about it until 2016 or 17 or so and then this this chart I'm showing you here was a survey that was done in 2019 so you know two and a half years ago and it's a third party did it, not, not Salesforce or any of these vendors. And they asked CMOs, marketing departments, who, who is your CDP vendor? Who are you using? And you can see we, we won here. And there was a previous one that showed us coming in first as well, significantly by, you know, by a margin. And we were very, very happy to see this. Um, although at the time we did not actually have a CDP in market. <laughs> so we're, we're winning a category that we're not in, which is very odd. And you can see we're number one there. And then Oracle had talked about a CDP, CX Unity, but it, it hadn't been released, not in not GA. SAP actually had not released their, their CDP. Some of these other ones had. Adobe actually wasn't in the market either. So you can see there's a lot of confusion. You know, a lot of people saying they're using something in CDP. It's not called a CDP. So that led to our you know painstaking analysis, which I was involved in, that, that built by um, make thing I, I mentioned. And where we ended up with all of that sort of, and we described this in our book, me and Chris, is that CDP is not new, it's evolution of CRM. We're not the only people who've said this, but I, I really believe this is true. And it's particularly true if you remember the late 90s. I know uh, you're all young people, um, so you may not even have been born in the late 90s, but uh, I was there. And I will tell you that companies like Unica we're talking about you know, uh, integrating your customer data from multiple sources, unifying it and um, making it available for segmentation and analysis, and then enabling you to pull lists and execute um, campaigns across channels. And what I've just said there is exactly what a CDP would promise. So it, it's not a new discussion. What's changed over time is that there's just a lot more channels, a lot more complexity, a lot more volume of data, a lot more variety, all the Vs have exploded and then of course there are things like cloud and um, more automation so the the cdp came has come along to solve the problem of disconnected customer data that has developed particularly acutely in the marketing context because over the years marketers have had to react to changing consumer behavior and people i will speak for myself are very hard to predict uh, and very, you know, fast moving in our whims. Um, for instance, social becomes a thing almost overnight. So what does a brand do? You need a social team and you need a social analytics team and then you need a tool around um, social publishing. And all these people tend to be off in their own room. You know, they tend to be maybe uh, recent grads because they get social better. Then mobile, mobile's already a thing. And then you have a web team and an email team. And you can see there's multiple teams, multiple tools, multiple vendors. And so you have the, the problem we have today. Then we also, we were looking at um, this survey around what customers are expecting from us. In, in general, this, this could hold true for any software company, but they want you know end user success, of course. But there's a lot around data management, help us manage our data and um, help us derive insights from our data. And so I think I talk to mostly the marketing team, a lot of times marketing analytics team, sometimes others like the CIO's department being Salesforce and our partners. And I would, I would say, you know, the data problem is acute. And the first solution that most CMOs went to was um, beefing up the data science team. And I saw this when I was at, sales, at um, Gartner in 2018. The investments in the data science team and that capability were, were doubling, tripling in marketing departments, and it was correlated with success. So it did work, but what that was was a um, a manual way. So you were you kind of building to putting together your own as a as a company, your own pipelines, and in a sense, building a kind of an abstract customer data platform or something that functioned that way. And so CDPs come along to try to productize that, to try to do what software does, which is automate things that are manual. And CMO has lots of you know, challenges, we'll say problems. But I will say in support of the marketing department that this pandemic, these past two years, when we've seen you know, massive digitization and rush to digital and digital first and acceleration, 
Uh, there was a question in the beginning if C, if um, the C-suite, you know, the board and the CEO, CFO would start cutting marketing as an uh, overhead expense. And what has happened is quite the opposite, that most companies have come to rely more on the marketing team because they're closer to the customer. And they are the people who had already um, instituted digitization plans where they were deep dealing with digital channels like digital storefronts and digital marketing and staying on top of email loyalty. And that has become critical to business success. So marketing has actually become kind of more important over the past two years than I thought it would be. Uh, not I, actually, I always had faith, but uh, then some people did. So marketing has risen to the challenge, but this is the you know Salesforce product strategy right here. And I won't unpack all of this, um, because it strays a bit from CDP. But just to explain in the long run, if you're wondering what Salesforce is doing, <laughs> oh, excuse me, it, it, it has a very, I think internally at any rate, clear strategy, which is to support business transformation, which ultimately is about helping different divisions within an enterprise work together. So it's creating a more coherent experience in general and more efficiency. And that is, that's how, how I see business transformation anyway. And the, the only way to do that is to do what we're showing here, which is build this platform. Now, the platform has on the bottom Hyperforce, which is a whole topic in itself, but it's basically Salesforce on the public cloud. So giving control over things like data residency with greater security and scale, the scale and, and cost savings that are available and going with one of the public cloud environments. Um, but still having all the goodness that Salesforce has to bring rather than using the private cloud, I think in the long run, that's um, it's already GA in some markets. And then data, a lot of the data things that um, I'm gonna mention that we had to build actually to make CDP work. Then customer 360 are all the apps that we have applications. So that would be sales cloud, service cloud, commerce cloud, and so on. And then the app ecosystem is um, the app exchange which those of you who use sales and service cloud know very well. And in the marketing cloud, strangely enough, we haven't, we haven't used App Exchange a lot just because of the way marketing cloud was built through acquisition. Um, because of the way we decided to build Salesforce CDP, App Exchange becomes a real player now. We, we've integrated into that. And uh, we already have App Exchange partners for CDP and we expect, expect, we have a big pipeline and we expect a lot of vendors to be available through there and a lot of solutions. And then Slack on the top. Slack is the, um, just think of it as kind of the, dis the front end for the distributed workforce. And there's a lot of potential in Slack. It's a relatively recent acquisition and a very big one. And at first I was thinking, I didn't, I didn't know Slack that well. I use it. I mean, we use it internally and we have for years, but I was like, um, I didn't see the uh, the potential that it had until they started incorporating it into our workflows at Salesforce. And you can do a lot of processes in Slack. You can do things like uh, get approvals for purchase orders and order a, uh, a new monitor. And it's all that kind of stuff that, that keeps a business running can be automated pretty quickly in, in kind of Slack, Slack workflows. And so the potential becomes clear. It's not just about sending messages. Um, the, so I did the build here. Chris O'Hara, uh, my esteemed colleague and friend, built the slide and he loves to do builds. He does one build and then he'll talk about it. And builds drive me crazy. So I was like, go all the way through. So you're seeing the entire slide here. Um, that just explains why we raced through it. But this is basically what a CDP does. And this is the Salesforce view of it, but it would apply pretty much to any, what we would call a system of insights or a classic customer data platform. My caveat to that statement is that there are over 140 different companies that call themselves CDPs now, or vendors, I should say, uh, who have a product labeled CDP. And they're in the Customer Data Platform Institute. That, that's where I got that number from. And um, they're all different. No two of them are, are exactly the same. And in fact, there are marketing stacks out there who have multiple vendors called CDPs who are complementary. <laughs> so in some senses, they don't overlap. Uh, in, I mean, in some cases, they don't overlap. So it's it's still, I would say, you know, emerging, um, disparate, not incredibly well-defined category, but it's getting better. It's in a much better shape than it was three years ago. 
And as we describe in our book, there are components that CDPs need to do uh, to be to be. There's a consensus now on what they're what they're supposed to do, and the RFPs are getting less like fishing expeditions, and more you know like uh, what we might call a mature category RFP. But this is what they do, and and um, many of you know this, but there are some nuances that I'll go through. So they have to ingest data and. Uh, this happens in two forms, ingesting data in, in batch. And in batch is, is perfectly fine uh, for many, many situations. But also there needs to be a kind of real-time ingestion component. Because the idea is that this unified profile that you're building, the profile of the customer or the prospect or the account, should be as fresh as, and uh, as updated as possible. And so that says if somebody has taken an action very recently, that's the real-time ingestion, that it would it would in some way be reflected in the profile so that you can make better decisions. Now, in general, if people don't interact with your sites, you know, you're doing um, drip campaigns, email campaign, whatever, it doesn't matter because uh, in general, there's no real-time data to ingest. But in some cases, it's very, very important. Uh, if somebody's on your site and they're they're indicating interest in a particular category, like they're in market for a mortgage or credit card or something, you need to know that right away so you can start personalizing. So that's a component of this, this real-time ingestion, real-time personalization is a component that architecturally is, um, is distinct, it's faster. And so you know, that, that explains in a way one of our design decisions, which is um, that we acquired a company called Evergage and Evergage is now called Interaction Studio, and it specializes in what I just described, which is real-time personalization. Of course, it needs to be uh, syncing the data that it has in its little mini profile with the master profile, the customer data platform profile. But they they were distinct enough that we we decided to define the enterprise CDP to include Interaction Studio and Salesforce CDP, even though they're two different SKUs. Um, the next thing that happens after ingestion is, of course, transformation. And really the kind of the plumbing, the hard work that the CDP does is here. It's in transformation and in um, mapping to a model and doing identity management. All that kind of stuff that is not glamorous is very difficult. And in fact, is the real value add for a customer data platform. And what I mean by transformation is, um, think of it like if you're building a really big table maybe not a literal table. I mean, it could be virtual or it could be um, federated or whatever. But in general, the idea is conceptually a big table and all the roles are the identities. Those are the people or the, the accounts. You need to deduplicate. If you have two rows pointing to the same person or account, you need to say, well, actually that's the same person. And I want my profile to be unified, including all the data I have about them. So that's identity management very complex. You need to be able to set reconciliation rules. What if one, you know, two different fields don't match, but two other fields do. So you have the same email, but you have slightly different names. Then you can say, well, this is 95% likely to be the same person. And you get the point. Um, that's complicated, but that's setting up the rows. And then the, the, the other thing are the columns. What are these field names? Different, different data stores will have different names for the same thing. F name, first name, F underscore name, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to kind of rationalize all of that in order to build the unified profile. And that's that's what um, CDP is tooled to do. And then the data lake piece, it's process at scale and hyperforce, you can see. This required, this was a dependency actually for our CDP. The, um, the requirement uh, in CDP, these all these profiles, um, is uh, it, it requires a lot of scale. There's kind of no other way to say it. You need a lot of storage and it needs to be efficient and cheap and so on. So that that pointed us toward project, what we were originally calling project Falcon. Falcon, because birds fly into the cloud, you know. Um, it turned out we, we changed the name to Hyperforce, but that required Hyperforce to actually be up and running because we didn't want to depend on, you know, Salesforce private cloud to do all the storage uh, in relational databases. The storage for our, for instance, a retailer might come to us and have 100 million profiles. You want to be able to support that kind of data volume. 
And so in order to do that, we had Hyperforce had to be up and running. Uh, so we were actually the first customer of Hyperforce, the CDP was. And then to execute, uh, you could send out on the right, you see access, which can power applications. The, the point here is that all this stuff that was built, all this goodness, identity resolution, um, data transformation onto the industry, the CIM data model, the ability to, uh, to process, to connect to and process data both in batch and streaming data, and then also Hyperforce, which I just said, all of those things don't necessarily have to be used in a single product. They could be made available in package in other products, in multiple products. It's part of a platform. So if we have this Hyperforce data lake, we have this uh, Hyperforce scale capability, then any, any product now or in the future that we want to build or our customers want to build um, on the App Exchange, for instance, or you know, we want to enhance an existing product or we want to do a migration, all of that, it's, it's available. So it's, these are services that are available across the platform. And an application can be built using them, incorporating them, and that would be uh, an example would be the Salesforce CDP. So it is a kind of points toward the product direction of Salesforce. And I think it is, um, it's, a, it's an exciting use of this data platform concept. And it, uh, it does make use of a lot of the, the very latest stuff that we built. But, you know, marketers need to execute marketing campaigns. That's what we do. And most of the users, most of the customers of our Salesforce CDP in the beginning are marketers, not all of them. Service teams can use it as well, commerce teams, but mostly marketers. And they're doing things like sending out emails, mobile push messaging, SMS. They're doing um, personalizing the experience on the site and doing social advertising and um, using their apps, doing ad campaigns and, and so on and doing analytics and, and uh, using data Rama Tableau, for instance, do analytics. And all of those things are um, use cases for CDP that have been prepackaged and kind of built out. So to sum up, you know, what our CDP does is these, these six things, more or less, managing consent is important as well. So consent is metadata on each row. You know, what, what permission do you have or not have to use that information in which context? And then segment, segment and understand the primary um, use that we decided uh, that our customers told us they wanted for the CDP was segmentate, like easy business user friendly segmentation. So le letting the team, unleashing the team on these unified profiles and letting them do things like um, pull an audience of people who live in a certain region and have Bernie's Mountain Dogs and are loyal customers and only shop at a discount. How many people are in that segment? And uh, if it's big enough, you know, we can do a campaign against them. If it's not, well, we'll try again. And what you're seeing here is a screenshot of um, some of the CDP, what it looks like. And then uh, there's a lot of connectors and uh, just a lot of sort of um, work that's being done to enhance it on every single release. Th there's been more features added to the CDP in 14 months than I've ever seen added to anything. And that we just continue to build it out. We had a year long test phase, which was the year of, um, what's this, 2022? The year of 2020, right before we launched. And that was, we had um, test partners, we had big companies all around the world. So there were probably a couple dozen of them pushing us and, you know, testing is giving us feedback in a bunch of different, um, bunch of different verticals and, and different regions, as I said, and we got feedback and then we incorporated that and we launched GA in the fall of 2020. So we've had, you know, over a year now to make enhancements. Um, what I'm showing you here is this vision for digital marketing. It, it um, depicts what I described earlier as the relationship of Interaction Studio and Salesforce CDP. And Interaction Studio, uh, as I mentioned, was an acquisition company called Evergage. Evergage is a personalization platform, and it really shines in that uh, real-time decisioning component. And it works very well, not exclusively, but very well early in the journey. So um, it works particularly well in the, a very difficult part of the, the marketer's job, which is if somebody arrives on a, on a site, for instance, 
uh, one of your digital channels could be a kiosk in a store or whatever, but we'll say a website and you've never seen them before, you, you know, they're anonymous to you. Um, you, you can, based on their behaviors, start, start kind of engaging them better. So you can um, put together a, a, what we might call a light profile, but it can be very powerful. So for instance, when I went to uh, hugoboss.com, one of my favorite retailers for the first time, they didn't know me at all. So it was uh, hugoboss.com. Are you, are you shopping for a man, woman, or a child? You know, you tell us. So they literally don't know me. So then I start looking at men's clothing and, and they know right away that I'm shop, I'm either a man shopping for men's clothing or I'm shopping for men's clothing. And so um, I'm looking at certain, certain type of clothing and you get the point that, that experience can be more and more personalized, even within a session, even with limited information. That Interaction Studio does that very well. It does that using machine learning and predictive modeling. Um, CDP, Salesforce CDP is a system of insight. It can ingest data in real time. So we, we added that when we launched, it was a, it was a batch proposition. Um, and the, the real time capability has been added, it's brought online. So you can land data, streaming data in our, in our CDP. And then, uh, you know, it goes through this ingestion, unify reconciliation, analyze activation, uh, all those steps, data transformation. We continue to improve the speed and capabilities of our CDP, but it is supposed to be that um, unified profile. It is, it's not, I don't, wouldn't call it a system of record. If you're, any of you are in the IT team, um, that's a dangerous term, system of record. I wouldn't call it that because there's probably most of our customers anyway, and most of the CDP implementations I know, the, um, there's going to be a lot of information about customers that you wouldn't put in a CDP. Maybe, you know, it depends on what you're selling, but you don't need every single scrap of information you know about everybody. Uh, and you may not even have uh, permission to include some of it in the CDP, but it, it's an abstract. It's that information that you can use for whatever your use case is. So if your use case is marketing or um, insights, you would put information in there about your customers that can be used for those purposes. If you're if you're including the service department as well, then you know you can unlock that rich richness. And the vision is always uh, to use the CDP. It's a unified profile customer or account, as I said, and it can be used. There's no reason it can't. It, it has to be used by marketing. You know, just think of it logically. It could be used by anyone who deals with the customer. It's customer data. So service is an obvious place where there's um, you know, a, a usefulness for something like CDP. And we do see you know, service teams looking at CDPs and service teams involved in implementation and even purchase decisions. Commerce, commerce is absolutely you know, relevant here. Loyalty, we have Loyalty Cloud now and loyalty is, can be a big component of the CDP story. You want to be able to attach things like what's your loyalty program and what's the unified profile you know um, what's the right treatment for somebody there's a lot of overlap there and then analytics of course analytics you know is everywhere <laughs> having been in the analytics team there's there's no data that's safe from the uh, prying eyes of analytics and and so on and, and also the vertical clouds so we we have at salesforce a verticalization strategy we have packaged solutions that are basically, you know, heavily pre-configured solutions for different types of industries, like you know, health and life sciences or financial services. And while today we don't have different flavors of the CDP necessarily, um, at least pre-configured different flavors like a financial service CDP, uh, there's no reason that such a thing could not be developed either by us or by partners. Or so I think that the you know we're just beginning the usefulness of a CDP across the enterprise. The most obvious, and I think the, the low hanging fruit is with the service team. And you know this what this example shows is just common sense, which is that if the service professional is looking at their service dashboard, and it could be in our service cloud, obviously we, we made a priority of, of um, integrating our service cloud with CDP, but it doesn't have to be our service cloud, it could be a competitor. But at any rate, when they pull up the profile, if they can see some of the information in the marketing profile, they're going, they'll have a better experience. So they can see at the very least, you know, um, 
what's what, what's the loyalty tier of this customer if they're loyal or uh, how how engaged are they with our marketing messaging or you know what have we profiled them as with how we segmented them on the marketing side so that I can at least make a better when we're resolve the problem in the call center and we're like about to make some offers or whatever I can at least at least make more relevant offers to them and powering industry clouds is uh ab, you know core to the strategy loyalty cloud loyalty cloud is is very exciting you know it's in some ways similar to cdp it's new ish but it's similar in the sense that we also did a, a build by a partner analysis and decided to build so it's been a very productive couple of years three years i would say for salesforce um engineering in in my world which is the kind of marketing world and loyalty cloud is part of that so it's providing tools for building up loyalty programs so i want to uh just have a little time here um i want to show you how we how we built it just kind of give you a picture of the infrastructure some of you may be interested i just have a couple slides on that i have a demo i i had um Murali, who is the engineer who led the team to build the CDP. And uh, he walks through at a high level how it works and what it looks like. So I, I did wanna show that. I, there's usually trouble with video on video. So it may not work. So don't get your hopes too high, but I will try that after I do this infrastructure thing. So we will give it a try. And Salesforce metadata, th this is, you know, metadata is the, the um, paradigm that we use for things like the Lightning front end. So it's all metadata driven, which means it, it can be configured so that any, you know, any two front end, like the UI on this uh, that dashboard you're seeing on the right, this is a profile of a, an individual, Jane Smith. It, it could look different depending on who's configured it, but it's all metadata driven. And um, we do use the cloud information model or the CIM uh, which is the, the same, basically the same, it's extensible and customizable, but it's the same open source data model that we use on the sales cloud and service cloud side as well. People who are comfortable in the Salesforce world, Salesforce admins, users of service cloud are become very comfortable with CDP quite quickly. It's actually, um, because of the usability mandate, it's actually very easy to use. The whole segmentation piece, the drag and drop, it's, it, is declarative and that's that is one of the um i think it's not only us but salesforce has been dinged in the past for being kind of a power user tool where you need to know particularly on the marketing cloud side you need to know amp script to be able to personalize marketing and if you knew it all this stuff then you could do some great um work but we've we've tried very hard to make things easier to use and it's not just for people who don't want to learn sql it's for people who know SQL, but don't have a lot of time or you don't have to build 10 campaigns in four minutes. Um, so all of that dragging and dropping that declarative, it's it's good for any user, you know, power user all the way down to non-power user. But that that is the paradigm for usability that we would like to be able to serve. And then this architecture I'm showing you here, we have CC Hyperforce on the bottom, lake house storage. We have a lake house concept, which is, um data being staged in various forms of usability so it's basically if you know how that works it's you've got like bronze type of data that's transformed a little bit and then you have um and that that might be all the raw data that you have landed in the in the data lake and that doesn't go away the raw data is preserved but then it's um it can be refined to the point where it's in this gold form which is um you know, the unified profile that has been completely rationalized and completely deduped and it's available for all your marketing. It's not the data in its raw form. So it's in, it's been refined in a certain sense. You may have um, lost some information along the way on purpose, made decisions to, to lose that information, but it has become very, very usable. So it's sort of, the idea there is that at some point, and we are working on this, the users of our CDP will be able to bring their own data lake so that you can, you know, access without physically ingesting data, you can kind of um, virtually access data that's sitting in other other environments.
So we're well aware that marketers need a lot of flexibility in terms of the data itself. And at a high level, this is, um, this is an architecture kind of schema. You can see on the top, I won't go through all these levels, but just on the top, uh, App Exchange. App Exchange is, is something that exists, and I, I mentioned it before. And I think that from my perspective, this is probably you know, one of the biggest differentiators that we have a fighting chance, you know, our CDP is, uh, is in competitive situations frequently. And there are, there are very few other CDPs that have something like an app exchange. And you might say, well, you know, who cares? But if you've seen Scott Brinker, our friend Scott Brinker, and I say friend, cause Chris and I interviewed him for the CDP book. Uh, he does a logo map. And on that logo map, there are over 8,000 different, different logos. And it is all the marketing technology and advertising technology vendors that exist. And so that's a lot. And if I'm a CMO, hardworking CMO sitting at my desk, there's potentially 8,000 different apps that I can choose. And that's only in marketing and advertising. You know, how do I make sense of that? Um, our approach here is that we, we want to build the CDP. So we would like to be the, you know, the unified profile but there've got to be other vendors using the data sitting within the unified profile. Any CDP needs to be able to integrate with other vendors who have do other things. Um, so that's where the app exchange comes in. Basically anyone can build an app and make it available through app exchange. You can either sell it or just give it away. And you know, we have customers, maybe you all deal with them or are them who build their own applications to kind of either fill gaps or do something that um, the tool itself doesn't do. And that's the promise of App Exchange. Our first partners in that space are you know, real value add, I would say, but they do two things that we don't do. We Salesforce don't do explicitly. And the two, the two launch partners were Epsilon, part of Publicis, so holding company, and then Mercury, part of Dentsu Aegis. And as I said, there's a, a big pipeline behind them. But those two, we started there because they do two things we don't do. One is the, their data vendors. So you can do, um, you can append data to the profile through, through them. And they do deduplication as well. So they have their own identity data and their own kind of profile data. And they can use that to rationalize profiles. And then they sell media. So we, we as Salesforce, we're not in the media selling business. We're not a publisher or whatever, or an ad exchange. So uh, they can you know, take those profiles and map them and um, execute campaigns with their media partners. And so all that is stuff that CMOs want to do, you know, marketers and users of CDPs want to do, and that's uh, available to be done through something like App Exchange. And then um, the other thing I'll mention is down on the bottom, you can see the storage, hot store, file store, SQL metadata store, uh, big data processing. All of this has been carefully thought out to increase efficiency and um, increase the throughput, but also you know, the CDP, the core identity resolution segmentation, the actual things that, that the actions that our users are taking within our CDP product. That's where we're doing a lot of our um, uh, innovation and a lot of our builds. And some of this is, this is, uh, the blue is actually new features. So these are, I think all of these are GA. This is, um, this is just a list of things that, you know, we've worked on and that we've put into CDP. And you can see, you know, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> We're focused a lot on um, ingestion. So at first, as I said, it was a batch process. Uh, a lot of CDP competitors were saying, well, Salesforce is all batch. Uh, we, have, we have streaming data ingestion. So that, that's important. We wanted to do it right. But um, things like uh, event trigger notification and then query federation service and all of that is we continue to shore up. The other thing is around insights. So um, we have an ability to do calculated insights which is you can create in a way, you know, you have the data that's sitting in the CDP, you can create fields that are combinations of other fields. So, you know, uh, column A times column B or something like that, or more complicated than that. 
And, and so that's a calculated insight and making that faster and having those insights surfaced and then also having the tool itself make suggestions. So adding real kind of automated productized machine learning into the tool itself is something that a lot of our customers are really appreciating. And then uh, connecting to other enterprise tools that we have within Salesforce. We don't only connect to Salesforce, by the way, this is a real CDP. So it connects it, you know, there's, there's connectability in both in and out to anybody through various methods, but uh, building a Tableau connector, because a lot of enterprises use Tableau. And why can't you point Tableau at the data that sits in the CDP? Well, now you can. And then MuleSoft, MuleSoft for data ingestion, that's a, a beast, you know, it's a monster. And it can unlock a lot of the data that's sitting particularly in, you know, homegrown systems, enterprise data warehouses through its, uh, you know, very, very powerful uh, API frameworks. And so um, why can't that you know, be used to ingest data into CDP? Well, now it can. So those kind of connectors. And then these are the release, the most recent releases, all this stuff has been GA. And the partnership part is another one that we continue to kind of focus on. Um, I mentioned some of our launch partners, but there's lots of discussions going on in the background in terms of who are the right, you know, who are the right partners. We'll, uh, I think that um, we'll make these slides available. And if you want to click on any of these, if you want to know more, there's kind of some links here about, uh, you know, learning more. How can I learn more? And so, um, I will try to show this video. Let me see how much time we have. Not much. I'll just show you a bit of it, um, the front part here. And uh, hopefully the sound will work. There's, um, there's no audio, Martin. I think it's because you're using your headphones. Oh, okay. Can you hear? So if you remember, I had data coming from 
70 pessoas. Nada está aí para você. Você vai só clicar no subscriber, clicar no contact aí. Vai ou não? Ok, so we will leave the suspense there. Telling us, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, so yeah, obviously there's there's more to share there, but um, you got a flavor of it, and I will uh, see if there's any questions. I know we just have a few minutes. Any any questions from the guys on the on the call? I, I I have a quick one. Hello. Sure. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, we can, can hear can you now. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So uh, so you, uh, Martin, you talked about the uh, the app exchange and the the availability of activation channels that are being developed. So we are currently doing a, um, a pilot on a, one one of the the, the competitors here at CDP platforms, and then they sell one of the USPs as being vendor neutral, and then the, the availability of a whole lot of uh, activation channels. Uh, and then I just want to know. If there is a strict, uh, like, uh, sort of a requirement for the the sales for CDP to be on the activation channels, be on the marketing cloud, or that is being developed, or that that's not a that's not a limitation currently, uh, so to speak. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, no, that's not a limitation. Uh, I think of App Exchange as a feature, but not a requirement. That we we have a way to activate. Um, you can you can. Put together an audience and activate it anywhere really going through the, the the cloud infrastructure that we've set up and uh the app exchange is really these are kind of pre-packaged uh, vendor solutions that um you know we're excited about but it's not a it's not a requirement all right thank you yeah i, I would say most you know most of our customers right now aren't using app exchange at all uh, for, with our cdp Cool. We have another question from Pep. Pep, go ahead. Hi, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for this presentation. Um, yeah. If one organization has just the CRM and all the integrations with MuleSoft and wants to start this marketing uh, with Marketing Cloud and uh, CDP, uh, you talk that for just the activation, you need the interaction studio, but uh, it is possible to start with the CDP and marketing cloud and without interaction studio in the in the upper of the graphic as so. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, they're they're separate. Uh, you know the way it is today, Salesforce CDP and interaction studio, two different products. The CDP is uh, and you know sold separately, used separately. Uh, quite often, we'll have customers who use Salesforce CDP and Marketing Cloud and use somebody else for personalization. Um, there's competitive, like Adobe Target, for instance, that is very common. They'd be using that, and that that's perfectly fine. I think they they work nicely together, but they're you know think of them as separate, separate yeah. but complementary. Yeah. But I think it's uh, if you want to start with Marketing Cloud. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's it's a good point just to start and do your own marketing CRM with the CDP and yeah. start with that. Yeah, yeah, it's very com it, that, That's the ideal path would be marketing cloud, Salesforce CDP, and if you know, we used to have something called um, uh, Audience Builder which is basically a yeah. way to do quick segmentation. CDP does what Audience Builder did. So it is. Okay, but then it's a uh, bad practice to have uh, the, just the marketing cloud connector with the CRM or the classic CRM and uh, activation for marketing cloud uh, without the CDP. This is no, not that's maybe- that's a pattern too. Yeah, that works fine too. <laughs> okay, then. Yeah. Well, <laughs> then thank you. Yeah. Um, we want to do a giveaway of the book, um, so we have a trivia question. If any of you can answer, then you'll get a free copy from me, and nice and signed and inscribed. I'll send it personally. Uh, so let's see what would be a good question. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, how how many CDPs are members of the Customer Data Platform Institute? One forty six. Oh, very good. <laughs> Who did that? Mohammed. Mohammed, all right. 
just uh, let let us know your um, address and the uh, CDP book will be in the mail. Thank you very much, Martin. Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank you guys for giving me the time. Hopefully that was interesting and we're here for you if you have any more questions. Yeah. Great. Thanks, awesome. Ali. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks very much, thank Martin. Very much. much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.